It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Linda McDonald Glenn. Professor McDonald Glenn is a bioethicist, futurist, attorney, and founding director of the Institute for Applied Ethics and Emerging Technologies at Crown College University of California, Santa Cruz, among many other accomplishments. And if I read correctly, what I don't, I didn't look at your slides yet, so maybe you changed the title. Okay. But when I read it first, it said it said you were going to be talking to us about radical relationality. So maybe that's still true. Yeah. Wonderful. And I'll explain that. Yeah. Okay. So then that's all I really need to say. And with that, I'm going to give you the floor and yeah, we'll talk again in the Q&A. Okay. <clears throat> all right. I'm going to take a moment here and share the screen. Okay. Let's go back to the Michelle here. Oh, oops. Went to the end of the slide. <laughs> All right. So again, I just wanted to thank everybody for the invitation. This is something that's so near and dear to my heart. And I've had the opportunity with Randall and another colleague, James Giordano, to discuss emerging, to have them present on a panel and do a presentation on emerging technologies. Ethical issues in emerging neurotechnologies. And I have to say, I think it was the best panel of the entire conference. I'm trying to get my colleague who ran the conference, Christoph Lodansky. He says he has the recording, but he posted it on YouTube yet. Looking forward to that being posted and sharing it with the rest of you because I think it was just an amazing experience. I sure know that the students enjoyed it. <clears throat> so radical relationality, boy, what does that mean? Well, my background, whoops, my background is a recovering attorney. I did not enjoy, I was an attorney for roughly 20 years. And I realized what's legal is not always ethical. What's ethical is not always legal. <laughs> and after so many years, I said, yeah, this is not what I want to be doing. I don't want to be doing general practice, divorce, law, slip and falls, car accidents. I went back to school and got my degree in bioethics at McGill which is really one of the best things I ever did in my life. And during that time, I came to the realization that there were these pervasive worldviews that influenced the way that everything was being done. As you can see on the slide, this is, this is, this is a phrase and small picture I put at the end of every one of my signatures because I think that we need to be changing the conversation and having a different look at how we approach many technologies. And personally, I love ethics of care. And this is where the relationality comes in. So, <clears throat> yeah, what about it? So what? Who cares? So relationality refers to the interconnectedness and interdependence of entities, systems, phenomena. It recognizes that everything in the world is interconnected and the relationships play a crucial role in shaping our experiences, identities, understanding of reality. And it highlights the significance of connections, interactions, and mutual influences between various influences. And it also emphasizes that the whole is greater than some of its parts and that relationships between entities often define nature and significance. And as it underscores the fundamental nature of a fundamental interconnected nature of existence. <clears throat> um, it overlaps with ethics of care. It's often called feminist ethics of care, but I think that that's 
I think that that it does. It's not necessarily feminist ethics of care. What it's what's radical about it, though, is that it challenges the traditional hierarchical perspectives. It's about relationships. The the traditional worldviews that, well, certainly I was taught and many people are being taught, were based on this idea of this great chain of being. This is from pre-Copernicus and pre-Galileo. The thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, that there was a divine hierarchy in, in place, and that everything had its place. And you'll notice from the slides that, oh, well, woman would be somewhere between man and animals. <clears throat> and what's happened is this has crept into our conversation in a way, in our dialogue, that we're not even always aware of. How many times have you heard someone say, oh, it's just a dog or it's just a cat? It's or it's a lesser organism. It's a failure to recognize that we're part of an interconnected system. We as humans, we don't live in a vacuum. We're part of a larger complex system. And understanding that and relating to that <clears throat> is not a conversation we hear. Well, it's a conversation that is now beginning to hear more and more. But let me just give you an example. <clears throat> and traditionally, under the law, something is either considered a property or a person. Well, because of this hierarchical perspective. Well, as we know from history, those boundaries have changed. Former slaves once considered property, now considered persons. Women, it took women, though, until the early 1900s to get the right to vote. And sadly, and still in some places in the world, they're still considered property of their husbands or their fathers. But as so I like to tell my students, that moral arc of the universe, hey, it may be law, but you've got to lean on it. You got to lean on that sucker. You cannot just let the universe try and sort itself out. This hierarchical model has been used as an excuse to, well, not treat the earth very well. It's led us to, to our crisis in climate change and also <clears throat> that... I don't know if any of you have seen the Club of Rome report from 1972 that showed that we're using up resources way too quickly. And if we don't change our ways, we will be heading for societal collapse around 2040. Now, you might say, oh, it's 1972. That was a long time ago. But Guy Harrington from KPMG just updated the numbers in 2020, and she found we're right on schedule. On the other hand, it, <laughs> there still is hope. And I've spoken with her, and she is still hopeful. There's still time to change things. And it's about taking a broader perspective. One of the things that is so important that I love about ethics of care is that it's an, ex, it's an invitation to expand our moral universe. Ethics of care states that primary moral obligation, our primary or our moral obligation is not to turn away from others in need. It's, like I said, an invitation to expand our moral universe beyond humanity, other philosophers, and this entire Generation Z is recognizing that 
humanity is part of the earth and that we need to act as part of the earth community. I'm sure many of you have heard about the Gaia hypothesis. <clears throat> so applying an interconnected holistic ethics of care is something that can help us create a better future because no one discipline is going to solve the world's problems. One of the things I love talking to my students about and with Randall about is theories of consciousness and ethics of care has so much to add to that conversation <clears throat> because that framework suggests that consciousness is not only it's not solely an individualistic phenomenon but is shaped and influences a shaped and influenced by our relationships and interactions with others that the, the theory of the extended mind <clears throat> consciousness emerges within a social and relational context and our understanding of self and others is really inseparable from this, from these relationships. Also, new advances in neurotechnology and our understanding of how our brains and how our minds work opens the door to recognizing the importance of empathy, compassion, understanding in our relationships with with others and the entire blossoming of generative AI just in the list, last six months has really led to so many questions and I think has helping to under helping humans helping us to understand there are certain things that we need to cling to, that we need, we ought to preserve our awareness and our understanding of our own consciousness, empathetic engagement, the consciousness of other, because consciousness is, is not isolated, but it emerges within the web of interpersonal connections and shared experiences. And, and certainly, as a bioethicist who served on many institutional review boards, <clears throat> this the ethics of care approach emphasizes the importance of attending to and caring for the well-being of others and not just necessarily in a human-centric fashion but in a way that recognizes recognizes the other beings with whom we share the earth <clears throat> and although and although we, the word consciousness is such a controversial word because it can mean so many different things to so many people. We do not have a lexicon. We do not have an instrument, say, to measure consciousness intensity we, or something that perhaps describes the spectrum of consciousness. But except maybe like the Glasgow coma scale, but that's more about, that's r restricted within the medical community. <clears throat> but having served on many IRBs, the thing that I realized is that IRBs, well, IRBs are limited to human-centric. They You have to focus on just the human subject. And it's understandable. There's a reason for that. IRBs were born out of the atrocities of World War II, and so human subjects needed to be protected. But we also need to be looking more holistically and understanding how we're part of a broader system and how those things interact with each other. And what we're beginning to develop, and this is one of the things certainly I'm excited to talk to the group about, is how this, how new emerging technologies, neurotechnologies can improve education, healthcare, personal well-being, 
we have an opportunity to make the future a, a better place. But we need to do it in a very thoughtful, thoughtful method. So one of the things that we've been doing at UC Santa Cruz is trying to come up with a slightly different framework. As I've been speaking with experts, we realized that this is a very much a standard approach to, th these are three different approaches. Institutional review boards are limited human subject review, ESG, environmental societal governance concerns. There's not really an agreed upon standard. And one of the things that we're doing, and I'll show you one of the models in a moment, is trying to create some baselines and show the interconnected relationships. There's lots of ethics and compliance firms out there, but ethics and compliance, well, those often are aimed towards making sure that the company doesn't do something illegal. And as I mentioned earlier, just because something's legal doesn't always mean it's ethical. And that's a pretty low bar to set. So we've been coming up with a framework that is the intersection of areas. And we've come up with these six domains. And I'm really excited to emerging neurotechnologies and developments intersect or interact with so many of these different areas, uh, which are all, all overlapping. Getting the model down on this has been a little bit difficult, but if you can imagine more of a color wheel where these three things overlap, I'm sorry, that we can start coming out with some standards. So it's certainly going beyond what, say, an emerging neurotechnology does, but how it's administered, how it's regulated. Randall, James Giordano, and I were talking about ethical aspects of Neuralink, and this has tremendous ties into all of these different areas. <clears throat> so it's... It's, it's so, as I had said earlier, it's just so critical that we have this interdisciplinary communication. I am, I am not a neuroscientist. I try and keep up the best that I can on emerging technologies, but I do believe that each and every discipline has something to add to the conversation. And we're we're just facing this this radical time. And we and we are changing worldviews to recognize from a more from a less hierarchical perspective to more of an interconnected inter recognition of the interdependence of us upon each other and all of our, our beings. So without going too much into the process, we started actually designing a hierarchical edge bundling scheme to try and understand all the intersections and, and where the nodes might be. And this is one of the things I really hope that we can continue to talk about. And <clears throat> work together on. As, as I said, it's the, if one discipline is not going to save the world's problems, it's going to take all of us working together and communicating together. And I would say that's probably pretty much it. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Now, of course, everybody, you can either type your questions into the chat or you can raise your hand. I'm going to go ahead and start asking Linda some questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and for reminding us about the interconnectedness and about having to be 
multidisciplinary in our approaches, which of course is something that is hard to do. For example, when I see when I see predictions made or futurists who are trying to paint a picture of the future. I think, for example, of the the book that Robin Hanson wrote about the world with whole brain emulation, his book about the world yes. with stems. And 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 then it's a it's a really deep dive that does a lot of work to take the principles from the sphere of economics and then to apply them to this idea of what does the future look like if you have emulated minds in there. But then you notice, oh, wait a second. So this world that he paints doesn't have any artificial intelligence in it. So, right. so right. it looks like then the whole brain emulation is what you use to do a lot of things that otherwise an AI might do. And then that paints a completely different picture of the future than you otherwise might get. So that's just one example of where... Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Not having all that interrelatedness really seems to matter. That's just a thought that popped into my head as I was listening to your to your talk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm quite curious, actually, about your take on consciousness. I, sorry to to go there. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, no, 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 no. In, in large this part, this is exciting because, because you, like, very clearly, like well, one of the things you mentioned that was that immediately stuck out, of course, was that you said that many people have very different idea when of what consciousness is when they talk about it, and they don't necessarily even use the term the same way which makes it a little bit problematic as a, as a tool for communication. And, and so myself, I've started to veer away from using it and trying to be more precise. That's what yes. I try to do. I try to, and even then I'm, I'm failing, but I try to do things like, okay, I'm not going to talk about consciousness. I'm going to talk about self-awareness or perceptual right. self-awareness or something like that. I try to go for whatever part of it that I'm trying to discuss. Do you have any recommendations there or how do you do this when you when you try to make sure that people understand which bit of it you're talking about? That's a it's a great question. And yeah, it is something that I've been th- thinking about deeply for well, for years, <laughs> for quite a while. And and I I I have observed there seems to be this tension between the origin or where where does consciousness come from? There's one view that it is very, that it it, it arises from complexity. And the other view is that it's an inherent part of the universe. And there's some non, there's something we don't know. Well, we don't know what we don't know, but I'm not sure that it makes that much of a difference because we are now building AI that is very rapidly approaching consciousness, however you might define it. Mm-hmm. And we we don't, so no matter which position you take, it doesn't really matter. You still get to the same place. (laughs) That is that consciousness is something that you can, something you can create, something you can develop, whether it comes from the complexity or whether it's it's, whether it's inherent. And our brains are transceivers that receive this information. So that's so that kind of that's one perspective and it occurs to me yeah our language certainly gets in the way we just don't have the language there's i was reading this great article about the consciousness of someone arguing the consciousness of the mycelium because of the communication between roots and trees and using analogies and comparing it to neural networks and how our brain works. And I thought to myself, boy, that's really fascinating. But then I also read a neuroscientist paper saying, this is nothing like consciousness. And, and as I read them, I thought to myself, they're talking about, they're kind of talking about two different things. They're different we things, just don't right? Have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't have the words. Yeah. We don't have the lexicon because, and this is one of the reasons that the interconnected aspect is so important to me because, all right, so let's say the mycelium isn't necessarily self-aware, which is 
subjective anyway, but it doesn't mean that it's not worthy of some moral status. It's sure. that, that is, that doesn't, yeah, it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't recognize yeah. its yeah. value and its worth. So I struggle with the same thing, Randall. It's like when I am talking about consciousness with a big C, with a small C, I'm going to have to be, or in terms of being aware of what's going on around us or whether, or consciousness on a Glasgow coma scale. <laughs> yeah, our language kind of fails us. And I really would love to see us develop a sort of a, a different lexicon because yeah. whatever it is, for example, that is in these different systems that we are observing and and we we're recognizing that there are patterns mm-hmm. that the, the patterns between the brain and the mycelium and, and pretty much all living organisms we just don't have a word for it so or a set of words for it yeah does that kind of answer your question it, it does and so i i felt like i should move on from consciousness to something else but then i still have this one thing that's so no, i'm going to stick to consciousness for just a moment longer mm-hmm. i think it's mm-hmm. also it's okay to talk about consciousness here because very often as you just mentioned we sort of associate ethics with the impact on conscious entities as opposed to the yes. impact on anything else right so and so that's why being able to define what the heck it is we're talking about or making a cut off somewhere and saying this is what we're really talking about or or saying it's all connected and therefore we have to care about it all even if it's not itself conscious we are aware of it etc cetera, etc cetera. those are important things in this context i think yes. so i was wondering if because you mentioned two kinds of consciousness and you contrasted sort of the universal consciousness with with the consciousness that emerges from connectedness or from complexity which sounds mm-hmm. a lot like, say, for example, IIT and similar theories mm-hmm. that, that Cope yep. and others espouse. Mm-hmm. But recently we had uh, Michael Graziano on here who has this beautiful yes. take on attention schema. And one of the things that I found really beautiful in one of his papers is really looking at, so why does consciousness feel the way it feels? Why is consciousness the way it is? How can we compare that with other parts of the brain that are doing something that seems like a more top or high level modeling that's going on and and the bit that jumped out was okay so consciousness could be described as or a conscious process consciousness process can be described as not just a sort of a a top level awareness of lots of parts of what's Mm -hmm. going on like vision and auditory etc etc body feelings and all that having a model of that, but it's really a model of the model. So modeling of the awareness of self. Right. You have a model of your awareness of yourself, then you believe you're conscious because then you have this thing that is basically you're creating your homunculus in a sense. You don't have a homunculus, but you've got a model that's building one for you that's giving you the perspective of a homunculus in a sense. Uh-huh. I'm putting a few words in his mouth there, but no, that's that was okay. Kind of no, I listened to it. Came across. it was, and the reason it, why this it, why this jumped yeah. up again, it came up in my mind as I was listening to you, is because you were talking about un- understanding ourselves and others, and that is the being able to build a model of someone else. That's the mm-hmm. modeling of others that are out there, and assuming that mm-hmm. they are in some way similar to us, so that we can project and think that there's something going on there that's similar to what's going on inside of ourselves and that sounds a little similar to the modeling of one's own awareness it's just that you're modeling someone else's awareness so it's all kind of connected in one way or another and that's interesting to me because modeling of others or Mm -hmm. modeling one's own experiences and creating a sense of consciousness that way you could easily also of course model things that aren't themselves conscious you could model that, that's right. mycelium networks and imagine what's going on there and find that valuable or have a sense of its value, just like you can have a sense of your own, the value of your own experiences. So that's interesting because it means that the boundary of where you put what you call what's an important part of your conscious experience, you can almost mm-hmm. set it wherever you wish, depending on how how much of the universe you decide to incorporate in your awareness in a way <laughs> well that's that's pretty yeah. i would say that that jives with the theory of the extended mind wouldn't you say 
I uh, guess so. I guess it does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess yeah, I'm no. looking for, I'm just looking for connection points between what, what all the different speakers are coming up with. Oh, yeah. yes. No, I, I listened to, to Mike Graziano's about the attention schema. Um, I, I listened to his talk and it was, it was uh, really, really fascinating. And, but, and what I kept coming back to was the subjectiveness. Uh, the subjectiveness of it. And can we ever truly model someone else's subjective experiences? Well, to some extent, we know we know that when we communicate with each other, I mean, what is it that what is it that we do when we tell stories, when we communicate with we we connect and and we we understand, we grok, we build models of the other person's experience that are in alignment with our own to find those commonalities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, I, I think that certainly what Mike Graziano had to say about that certainly plays an, an important role. And I would love to talk to him about the other intersections. Two. I see that there's a question in the chat here by Robert Clark, and I just wanted to check if Robert wanted to say or verbally express the question, or should I just read it out? If I hear nothing, I'm going to. Oh, oh, go out. ahead if you don't mind reading it. Yeah. Okay, oh. I'll read it out then. Yeah. So okay. Robert asks. He says, "Hi, Linda. Thank you for the amazing talk. I hadn't thought about interconnectedness regarding other organisms in, of the world in relation to neurotechnology." It's a very blue sky, borderline crazy question, but do you think that BCI technology could see the means of communication with other organisms such as mycelium? There's a lot of work into mycelium-based computation, and there have been research that has shown that they show intelligence and even that neurons in a Petri dish being able to play Pong. Um, What are your thoughts here? Oh my God, like organoids. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, I'll, and I yeah. guess there's a second part of the question. Also, another question based on your law experience: the idea of neuro rights has only been implemented in a single country, Chile. Do you think that this should be more of a concern for governments in protecting the mental privacy, amongst other things, for their citizens? Okay. Yeah. Well, that first question, I love. I mean, both of them are great, but that first question, I do, I don't think it. Oh, Robert just offered to read it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, well, sorry about that. Well, you can still uh, interact directly if you like. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think it is, I I don't think it is an outrageous or totally, I, I don't think it's, I think there's a lot of merit to what you're suggesting. Because one of the things to one of the ways that we are beginning to examine and understand consciousness is we're looking at the patterns. Mm. That's partly what Robert Graziano was talking about, the attention schema. But there's also other patterns that perhaps are comparable to the human, to the human mind. And we don't know what we don't know and I think in the spirit of exploration, the spirit of exploration and understanding the world around us, that it's important to discuss that. And it's also a way of showing, a way of showing the interconnectedness that we do not exist in a vacuum. Humans do not exist in a vacuum, that we have things in common, that biomimicry that learning from the communications of the mycelium or the trees like in susan samard's work is it is, is something that is extremely valuable because it it helps us understand the relationship to give you sort of a this might be this might be a little bit oversimplistic but maybe not it <laughs> Many, many years ago, I gave a presentation called Brain in a Box. And the question was, if you don't have any sort of 
how can a brain exist or how can a mind exist unless there is some sort of sensory input? Otherwise, you just have, it's, it's hard to imagine what that would be. It is pretty much, I think, impossible to separate what goes on inside the brain and in the mind without referencing it to external stimuli. And <clears throat> by learning about how, learning about the intelligence of the mycelium, the the intelligence, the 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 intelligence we can learn from biomimicry that oh and the thing about organites, oh my gosh, I, I have to say I am having pardon the pun, but I am having a hard time wrapping my mind around that. And we're actually having a discussion at UCSE later today about organoids, chimerism, and other weird stuff. So that so I hope that answers your 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 question, Robert, the first one. In terms of the neural, in terms of the neural rights, boy, that is, it's an area of concern. Others have written about it in terms of cognitive liberty. And I think that we're going to see a shift in the law about that. The Supreme Court, many years, I can't remember the time, had ruled that someone could not take peyote even as part of this, as a religious ritual, because it still broke the law. But now you have the Supreme Court that's much more in favor of religious liberties. You may see that change. Also, in terms of the Fifth Amendment, the right against self-incrimination, as neurotechnologies advance and we share thoughts or create... Should those things be protected? And this is one of the things that certainly has worried me about Neuralink is, or, or uh, such interfaces, is who owns, who owns those, the results? Let's say, and, and there's, there's been articles coming about, out about how brain computer interfaces and AI they are now able to show, I use that term, show what somebody is thinking. So, and we all have bad thoughts, okay? We're only human. We're not gods. So it does worry me. How do we protect our cognitive liberty? This should be, yeah, or mental privacy, as you said, because, because I do, I, I guess I'm a little old-fashioned this way, I do, I do, well, even if we don't have free will, we have to act as if we do. <laughs> because there's otherwise, I do, oh, yeah, 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 there's another term we could have a, a whole discussion about. Yeah. Because how, how else do we hold people accountable? Now, there's certainly lots of, opens up a whole nother area about how whether or not you're really in control of your actions. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you do have to act at least within the law as if there is such a thing as free will. Otherwise, how on earth would we hold people accountable? I have a question. So yeah. can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. So with these devices, we are going from a, a neural oscillation to some sort of output, some sort of description of what that means. And I'm sorry, I, 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 missed, I missed the first few words. Yeah, we're going so from, we from, from a neural oscillation, so some sort of brain signal, okay. to a meaning. Yep. And there's an algorithm involved in that. Now, I don't think there will ever be a point where we can fully say that the algorithm is a hundred percent correct always and it is able to determine what a person is thinking how how do you think governments or people who want to use these algorithms to determine what a person is thinking for whatever reason 
to really go about that. Because once you say that this algorithm isn't always going to be correct, then you put in the doubt and therefore mm -hmm. can it be trusted at all? Because there's always, because just because you, you mentioned the fifth amendment and, and that sort of side of things, I thought, well, can you ever really trust it? Can you, can you not always have the excuse of, okay, yes, the algorithm said this, but it has this percentage of probability that it is, is incorrect. Right. I good. That, that, that's a good question. And I learned a long time ago that when it comes to individuals, statistics don't always hold, don't really hold a lot of weight. For example, someone, and I'm going to give you a very personal example. I lost my first husband to leukemia in 1984. And <clears throat> When he was diagnosed in 1982, he was very, very sick. And the doctors told me that there was a 98 to 99% chance he would not make it through the next few months. Well, he did. And he went on to live for another two years. <clears throat> it was, in their eyes, something of a miracle. And I think that, yeah, we are facing a situation very much like lie detectors. Lie detectors are not admissible in court be because of their lack of reliability. And, you know, the state police, when I was representing the state police in Rhode Island many years ago, one of the officers said, you can always fix a, a lie detector test by popping a Valium ahead of time. It throws off all the readings. I would imagine we could do the same thing with one's thoughts. <laughs> that, that is, you can alter your state of consciousness pretty easily so that it's not always pre predictable. So discussing the, I, first of all, listen, I, yes, I think it's a, it's a valid concern. I think we do need to be thinking and talking about who owns your thoughts that, that we should retain our own thoughts. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that? Do we do it over the contract? Do we say for Neuralink or other brain computer interfaces? Yeah. Um, yeah. I promise not to read your thought. There are, I mean, there are good ideas that people Sorry. talked about is having personal blockchains. So like personal chains of okay. yeah. data stores that they have for themselves. I've seen a few papers about this, but it's not something that people yeah. really talk about a lot. So that would be a technology that you could use to try to provide some sort of security for privacy mm -hmm. of data, of any kind of data, whether it's brain data, right. DNA data, and so forth and so forth, document data, contract well, data. Why, yeah. But um, why wouldn't we simply that certainly, just say no? But I think yeah. the question of how, how do you do it technically is kind of one step after even it considering is. the ethics and the laws of it. And in the chat, I added a note about output because output versus mm -hmm. input, because we're talking here about the privacy of the data that is in our brain, in our mind, mm -hmm. and about it leaking out, being seen, being viewed, being used. So that's the output side of that, right? But what that content in the brain even is and how we react to things, who we are, is determined largely by the input that we get because of learning. Oh, and we're seeing this right. very clearly with AI right now because people are concerned that AI will draw bad conclusions or do racist things or whatever because of how it's been trained. So the input mm -hmm. that it's been getting. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about data privacy on output, mm -hmm. but are we concerned at all about data privacy on input? Because for example, there's advertising. That's one example. Oh, uh, absolutely. Indoctrination or propaganda is the more severe evil version of advertising. And then there is, of course, just child rearing, 
raising your children and teaching them what you believe, like the earth is only 6,000 years old. And so we are creating what the content of a person's brain is. But there don't seem to be a lot of laws about filtering that quite the reverse. It seems like the laws have been put in place to retain the freedom to throw at people whatever you want or whatever you prefer. And if they're your children, then you can you can control what they get to see and what they get to learn. I find this interesting and possibly troubling. Oh, goodness. Yes. I mean, and we are seeing this with social media. If, if any of you watched The Social Dilemma, so, so much of social media is designed to, to hook you, to bring you in and, and keep coming back. And that's exactly what you're talking about. I think you're talking about, Randall. It's it's input. It's it's a form of I've heard the term neuromarketing. It's indoctrination. I, I can't remember who it was. It says who who was it that said it? It's rather a dark saying. But if you say something long enough, loud enough, and often enough, it becomes truth. That's a horrible thought. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I was just looking at the comment. It relies on a well-educated populace. Yeah, sorry. It's it's probably a bad no. habit to be sending things to chat at the same time while the conversation no, is going I, on. I understand. I do it all the time. And this is one of the big considerations. I, I'm not I'm not suggesting that we necessarily go back. There's there's a few things that have changed over the last 20 or 30 years, and I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this, but back before cable and the internet, the FCC regulated content to the extent on TV saying it ha you had to give equal time to, a to different viewpoints. It had to be, oh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the yeah, phrase yeah. right I now. Think, yeah, but, I, I know uh, what you mean, though, yeah. Equal yeah. to different opposing views. Yeah. Right. And it was a way of making sure, it's a way of making sure that propaganda didn't prevail. And, and, and partly that arose out of the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s, because we didn't, we didn't want propaganda creeping into our society or own only one viewpoint. Now, uh, things changed, and part of, uh, things changed, especially when we, especially when economists said, or, "Well, no, the free market will balance itself out." But the free, the idea of a free market is that the idea of the entirely free market without regulations is that it will somehow regulate itself, but it doesn't take into account power imbalances. It doesn't take into account the fact that if you create and, and have the advantage to create a propaganda machine, that you will, that serves to your benefit. So, so your, go ahead. In your experience, because I've seen some discussion now about concerns regarding the input to the brain when people are talking about BCI, because there's the notion that you then have direct ways of going into the brain and perhaps changing how someone feels about something, mm -hmm. making them happy, making them sad, and so forth. So you have there could be external players who have, for some reason, the ability to do this to your mind. And so that entered the conversation. But the question that I have is, why was this not part of the conversation already? Or are there already laws in place? Are there ethics in place that do this? When we're not talking about BCI, but we're talking about other ways of giving input to people, whether it's through education, through imagery, through whatever. Do you know of anything that's out there right now that protects us? Maybe I'm just not. No, out of the I'm sorry. Here. No, no. I'm kind of thinking about optogenetics too. That is the, the ability to change someone's behavior with a beam of light through their eye, change the genetic expression. The only thing that we really have in place is Institutional review boards. 
that protect against human subject experimentation. But these only apply once a person becomes a subject. That is, I know, I yeah. know. We if that there in lies the dilemma. I mean, the whole social media explosion is like this giant experiment that was not run through an ARB. Mm. But this is one of the reasons that we're trying at UC Santa Cruz to create an entity that will maintain ethical integrity through peer review. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model. It's IRBs limited to human, but in IRBs, we're not even permitted. In, in hum, we're not permitted to talk about societal impact or inequities. But what, so why not create, I've nicknamed it Turbo, the Tech Ethics Review Board, but there's other names floating around too, like the Complex Adaptive Coalition and things like that. But yeah, I mean, there's nobody saying, there's nobody saying, oh, we should not, there's nobody saying we ought not experiment on large amounts of people with social media. Hmm. So maybe, <laughs> but maybe we want to try and set some guidelines. Yes. I mean, and so Elon Musk loves to mess mess with people by tweeting something and seeing how people react. He's, he lays, it's the puppet master trying to pull strings. It's because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The idea is that one of the ways we need to manage this is through a balance of powers. Uh, That's a good point. Um, yeah. And yeah, about. And yes, thank you, Robert. My email is lmglenn at ucsc.edu. And I would love to continue the conversation. Oh my gosh, we've already. Yeah, we, we are running up against the end here and people are leaving. But thank you so very much. And you're absolutely right. So the most important thing is that we continue the conversation because there's so much here that mm -hmm. has no solution at the moment. And I'm I'm very interested, for example, to learn about what you may think is the best possible outcome, where we should go. So there are lots and lots of conversations to be had. Oh um, my goodness, yes. And and now that I'm feeling better, I'm looking forward to picking up the conversation because what we want to do is have a use case that we can analyze and publish. And I had to put that on hold for a while, but I'm looking forward to seeing if we can do it, get that done again. Thank you all for listening. That was well, really thank you. Thank great. you for coming and and for giving us your your thoughts and insights. And I'll probably head on down to UCSC in the near future. So it may come. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. That would be <laughs> yeah. great. That would be great. great. Well, thanks everyone. This has been wonderful. <laughs>